Welcome to the Grief Bully Podcast. I am your host, Jay Nicole. Thank you for joining our weekly discussion around grief, mental health, and your overall personal wellness. The Grief Bully Podcast will serve as a vehicle to help you navigate life's journey. Be sure to subscribe, review, and share the podcast with anyone in your life that you think it will help. Let's bully grief together. What's up, what's up, what's up, beautiful people? Welcome back to another episode of the Grief Fully Podcast. I am your host, Jay Nicole. Today is Monday, March the 15th. We are back in the studio, rocking and rolling, episode 83. I'm excited. I got my co-host in here today, and we are going to dig a little deeper into the Netflix movie that came out February 28th, 2020, All the Bright places i got my co-host with me today adina J. what's up queen hey let's go so we're gonna get right into it today last week was a phenomenal episode where we went a little bit deeper into hill billy elegy so if you haven't checked it out yet definitely go check out that episode right here on youtube and subscribe to the channel while we're at it and let's keep this thing going so we watched this movie quite some time ago so Mm -hmm. we kind of got to jog our memory a lot has come up on our schedule we haven't been able to get right into it but a DJ right. was free, so I invited her to come in today with me to get into it. I think a lot of times when I'm just on here talking solo, it's great. I think I think I'm great. I'm gonna go ahead and say that, guys. But <laughs> not that great. So whenever I could bring someone else in for a different perspective to help us to continue to grow on this grief journey, I'm absolutely going to do that. If you are not aware, I have been reviewing movies that have grief showing up on the big screen. So what does that mean? Grief is in the premise. And we are looking at the movie from the vantage point of grief, not so much from how other critics might perceive the movie and their their outlook and their take on that movie. So this one, we can already say, made us both cry, get choked up for sure. Yes. And so let's get into it. All the Bright Places came out February, like I said, I think 28th, 2020 on Netflix. And the two main characters in the movie were... Elle Fanning and Justice Smith, but their names in the movie were Violet and Theodore, and his name was Theodore Finch, so his name was Finch. So yes. Violet and Finch. and Finch. Sorry. Finch. Finch. Yes. Okay. What am I saying? I thought you were saying fish. No, I'm saying <laughs> Violet and Finch, like F-I-N-C-H. Yes. Finch. Okay. okay. Yeah. Let's not say it again. <laughs> Let's not say it again. So the movie was multifaceted when it Mm -hmm. comes to grief and the reason why I say that is because I started out thinking it was going to be more so about okay time out spoiler alert we're definitely going to spoil the movie so super spoiler alert it is what it is right so we started out watching the movie thinking that the grief was mainly going to be about Violet's life Right. And then you start, as the movie starts to unfold, you start to see more how Finch's story intertwines. And he's a very interesting and intriguing person. Yes. So where do you want to dive in with this? I don't know. It's so much. So just start from the beginning, I guess. Okay. So start from the beginning. Ah! Okay. So basically, in the beginning of the movie, we meet Finch and he sees Violet like on the edge of a bridge and eventually we find out in the middle of the movie that that's where her sister was killed in a car accident so the beginning of the movie starts there and um then they're teenagers by the way teenage yeah it's very important to highlight yeah teenage teenage people um and so basically we start there and so Finch begins to develop a relationship with Violet more so in the way of trying to help her get through her grief and also get back to or find some happiness. Right? Yeah, he was I mean he was crushing on her. Let's true, say that. True. So so he so let me just let me just paint this picture too. So he's basically like what you would consider an outcast. In his school. Right. So a handsome guy, not, nothing like that. Like it was just one of those things where I believe that the behaviors that he has displayed mm-hmm. over some time in school kind of put him in this category of, of maybe an outcast, a freak. That right. was one of the things they were calling him as, as a nickname, but kind of a, a bullying type thing. Definitely. So Violet, though, was popular. Right. And she was kind of dating someone and had all these things going on, just teenage life. And then she has this abrupt loss. 
So she loses her sister, who she was very close to, yeah. in a car crash that you do eventually see that she was in. Mm-hmm. So she was in the car as well when her sister had they had an accident, and then her sister her sister died. And so from that, Violet actually stops driving. Mm-hmm. So she becomes afraid of driving, which rightfully so. I believe that most of us probably would feel that way, potentially, if that happened to us. Right. And then... Finch happens to be out running, jogging, which becomes very important in the story that he was mm-hmm. actually jogging. And he happens to see her, I guess it was like in the morning time. I don't know if that was 100% clear. If it was night, morning, it was just like that kind of overcasty vibe. I don't know. So who knows what time it was. But she was on a bridge, like Adina said there. And we later on find out that she was considering or felt in a moment of despair this might be an alternative for her. And he walks up to her, kind of helps her get down from it. They don't really, at that moment, foster a relationship. They kind of go on throughout the movie, but then a school project comes up and they have to go around and see different things. And so this movie is called All the Bright Places. I think it's important also to note that she was isolating after that loss. So she was, she stopped going out, stopped hanging out with friends. So as, you know, Jay Nicole talks about on the podcast a lot is the, you know, the difference between between grieving and mourning. And what is it? Let's stop right there. This is a this is a lesson right here as a frequent guest co-host on the Grief Bully podcast. And you're referencing something that Jay Nicole says. I want to know what you think that is. So what is the difference between (laughs) grieving and mourning? What do I get if I get it right? To come back and guest co-host again in the future. Uh, Okay. Well, the difference is the grieving is the inward expression and the mourning is the outward expression. So she was definitely in in a dark place. And so in that situation, like I said, I think it was important to mention that there was some isolation going on. So you... So you wanted to say that there was some isolation going on. I distracted well, I you so far from the from that that I forgot where we were even going. But you were saying that it was important to note that she had isolation going on. Violet. Right. Right. I didn't even say that because I forgot that she was also then becoming an isolated person after being popular and just right. kind of in the mix. And what do you what do you think that did though? Because I think it showed in the movie her becoming isolated, what that looked like to the surrounding cast, the other people in her life. Well, they didn't understand, of course. They were telling her, like, you should go hang out with your friends. Her parents even were saying that. So you could tell that she was struggling a lot trying to figure out how to pretty much manage everything around her. Yeah, and I think for her friends, too. And I mean... You could look at it and say, well, they were teenagers, so of course they don't understand that. But I think that's a lot for adults as well. And that's why we're breaking down this movie, because it's not that we just want you to go watch the movie, but we're trying to continue to draw those parallels between grief, our real lives, and then what we see in the movie and how those things are very similar. So you could think, well, teenagers don't understand, but I think that's a lot for adult life as well. When we go through things, whether that's loss of loved ones or just things in general, People kind of take it offensive and they and they so badly want you to get back to who you were prior to those experiences happening to you. Would you say that that was evident with like the partying and not wanting to do certain things? Yeah, for sure. And I think a lot of times people want you to get back to that because they see the despair and they see, you know, the hurt and the pain. And so that's hard for people to, you know, witness essentially. And so they want you to get back out there or, you know, like kind of, you know, get back to how you used to be, I guess. Yeah, I actually think her, the, the guy that she was dating, I think he actually said in the movie, like, when will this be over or, or when, hmm. so how much longer? I think it was, I don't something know the exact like verbiage, that. but it was something along those lines at that party, like basically how, how much longer will she be in this phase or stuck in this situation and not being back to who she was and right. kind of how things were. Because this is the thing. When we go through these types of losses and experiences, our lives changed. Their lives did not. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a huge PS that we all have to understand because 
I think lately I've been in this season of showing the angles from both the bereaved and non-bereaved. Because I think sometimes the mm-hmm. grief community, and as a person who is bereaved, we, we both are, most of us are, we can have expectations for, for people and we can also talk more so about our loss and our despair and our issues, but not really recognizing how challenging that can be for people on the outside, not knowing how to be there for you and be supportive and, and be a friend and give you that that love. And a lot of it is just due to ignorance in terms of lack of experience right. and guidance. So if you're looking at them as teenagers, they really have no freaking idea. Right. And I, and I can see myself and my friends being similar to that in high school. In high school, I don't remember experiencing too many losses that we kind of had to try to navigate together. Mm-hmm. But now teenagers are dealing with it at an alarming rate. Yeah. And also when you were in high school, which was a long time ago. Wow. Why do I keep like like no social media? Shots fired. I don't even want to hear it. Shots fired. Okay. I'll I'll just say, you know, I'll give you that. You're right. There was no social media. So what do you, what what role does that play in it? You think? I think that plays a big role because there's just so much more access to just like everything that it's, ultimately you know overload you know so i think that is is a good it's not good it's an important um thing to kind of it's an important variable there you go that's what i'm trying to say an important variable to note so the exposure to the losses on social media or just social media in general meaning needing to keep up both and look a certain way yeah yeah i think that look a certain way thing too is is very and also, too, though, can you think that social media can work in the opposite where there can be more, I don't want to say it's not genuine, but from young people, perhaps, or even adults, a cry for help could maybe be considered attention seeking and not looked at as a real issue or, or problem? Because people say it's a lot. Why would you come all the way on Facebook to post that? Or why are you saying this or, or putting your business out or X, mm-hmm. Y, and Z where... I think it's a, I think it's a crossroads there because this essentially has become our language. Mm-hmm. Social media is sure. really, really the number one way people communicate, and I would argue that I don't know the stats, but I, I think would probably people agree. communicate that way. So if that's how people communicate the most, well, why wouldn't they post on Facebook whatever they're going through? And I understand there's levels of privacy, and I I implement that for my own life. I am very transparent, but there are things that I do keep close to the chest that I think are important for only my my circle and my family and my friends. But Mm -hmm. when it comes to teenagers, especially, I think we got to keep an eye on that because you don't know because this might be the only way they feel comfortable communicating. and, And you say, oh, they're just crying for help and attention. They don't really need anything. And then it's like, oops, I wish I would have actually gave Mm -hmm. that attention. So yeah. I'd rather be overbearing than fall back. Right. Especially yeah. if it's young people in my life. If I see like my nephews or nieces or anybody giving me any signal or sign that mm-hmm. something might be off, I'm the one looking in their background. So nephews and nieces, p- pay attention to what you guys are posting because I'm watching. I'm like, <laughs> well, that background looks like they could be at a part. I don't know what's really going on here. Do you think that they're doing this? Mm-hmm. Like it's just, it's just too much. I'm doing too much. So... <laughs> Back to all the right places. The movie was one, and we talked about in the beginning that it made us get a little emotional. A little? I was bawling. Right, a lot, a lot. A I lot. was Marco, legit bawling. Yeah, so it was really sad. So Violet and Finch ended up fostering their relationship. Part of their school assignment was to go to different places in their town. I'm losing, I don't know where it was at this point right now. But wherever their hometown was, they were to go around and see these different places and then kind of write about it and compile Mm -hmm. it into one presentation at the end of the year. And so he's taking her on these different places around and they're building these memories and Mm -hmm. keeping track of it all. And through that, they kind of started to feel each other. Yep. And and then they kind of they fell in love and they Mm. became intimate. But it wasn't that easy because while Violet was dealing with her grief. Finch was mm-hmm. dealing with his mental health. Mm-hmm. So I'll let you kind of jump in there about Finch's mental health and how that was important to see on the screen. 
Oh, man, that that was really important because, again, like we were talking about teenagers, sometimes they get lumped into this category of, oh, you're young. Like, oh, that is not a big deal. Like, get over it. You got so much life to live. You know, those things that people say, you know, when you're young, which in part is true, but also in part, a lot of uh, teenagers do have trauma and they do have, you know, experiences that shape their mental health for you know layman's terms and in the movie that is very evident and I think that how can I say this I think that for me watching the movie I immediately picked up on it and that's all obviously because I've worked in the field, you know, and so I I see different things. And of course it's a movie, so they want you to put it all together eventually and figure it out. Um, But me more so probably sooner than other people. This one over here. But we then we started talking about like, oh, maybe you're right. And I'm like, I, you know, I'm kind of feeling like da, 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 da. And then she's like, I don't know. And then, then we're like, oh, yeah. OK, so his mental health played a really big part in ultimately the, de- the demise of their relationship. Uh, the way he interacts with other peers in school. Yes, very true. He was like a to- he was like a total different person. Yeah, who he was around Violet and with her, two different was people, way different than who he was amongst not his friends because he had two friends that yeah, were in the movie, did. but the other people and peers within his school. But with her, he was he was cool. He was a cool cat. I, yeah. I was really like we, lo- really we loved feeling him. it. We loved it. Man, we- R.I.P. Finch. Right. It was it, it, it was rough. It, they had such a great um, bond and respect for one another, and just kind of. They just were, they just were good. They, you know, they were good together. But anyways, so back to the mental health and uh, he had some trauma, you know, abuse in his childhood, uh, seems like some neglect. Um, So it was just him and his sister. It seems like she might have primarily been his sole caretaker or raised him or whatever have you. And the part where it starts to turn or where you start to put the pieces together is when Violet starts hanging out with him and his friends. And then he starts to disappear, becomes really flighty, not, not returning phone calls, texts, whatever. And then they kind of tell her like, you know, that's just how he is. He'll turn back up eventually. So it seems like they were aware that he has these patterns in which he comes and goes for days you may or may not hear from him. Yeah, that was important because, again, going back to teenagers and how it's important for us to understand that they don't really understand because they just chalked it up to that's just kind of how he is. Right. And they weren't able to understand that there was a deeper underlying issue. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you bring up about his sister is that she was his biggest fan. She was in his corner. She was there. And she also couldn't prevent the unfortunate outcome of the end of this movie. And so those are the things that are important, too, is that sometimes you can have people who love you and are around Mm -hmm. you. But when Mm -hmm. you're dealing with mental illness and trying to maintain your um, a healthy mental wellness, battling mental illness, it becomes quite the struggle. And even though you're there for some people, you cannot solve that for them. Mm -hmm. And so I want to free somebody right now that feels like defeated because they have been trying their hardest to be there for someone that is struggling with their mental illness and not seeking their proper help and not getting help because he was in like some kind of treatment treatment. He was going to like a group Group therapy therapy setting. He had like a guidance counselor one-on-one meeting. So there, so the movie did a great job. I think as I'm thinking back now, I don't even know how phenomenally I thought it was done while I was watching it. But as we're thinking back, it shows so much of that. It showed that he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. The mom wasn't present. The dad had abused at some point. The sister was there. So they're kind of like these latchkey teenagers to an extent making dinner for each other. The sister's working, trying to do her thing. Mm-hmm. They showed a bullying. They showed the mm-hmm. him going to this peer meeting where actually one of the girls who was kind of clowning him in front of everybody was dealing with her own mental health stuff that she was going through that she was too ashamed to say. So right. she's, but again, but he kept that cr- quiet when he saw her at the meeting. He didn't out her 
whatever. But it showed that at the guidance counselor, it showed how teenagers just perceive you and then make this whole thing. Mm-hmm. But what I like about when, when Violet and Finch were getting close, they were by themselves. So it also showed the power of just having that one person, person. Mm-hmm. that can kind of vibe with you and mm-hmm. doesn't matter what other people think or, or how they aren't, that you have that person can really help you. And it did help her. Right. It, it helped her a great deal. And she didn't realize, though, that he was kind of... I don't want to say sacrificing himself, but kind of, I think mm-hmm. neglecting himself and, and being so immersed in bringing her to joy and the happiness that then it was triggering for him. But what do you think about when he was talking about this whole idea of when I'm awake versus when I'm not that part? I was like, is it meaning like depressed, not depressed, engaged, not engaged? Yeah, I think that's what it was kind of referring to. So they never like they never specified what he was struggling with specifically like depression or anxiety or, or, you know, what those titles or those labels, but he did use the phrase awake and, and you can just infer that that's like what he was talking about. Like when he's depressed versus when he's not depressed. And, um, he did have some like, you know, or, you know, erratic behaviors yeah, where outbursts, he was yeah, wilding out. Yeah, over. he was doing like, you know, some stuff like that. And again, like he would go jogging at, like in the morning with like jeans and stuff on, just like not, not like your typical right. workout gear. Right. Yeah. Um, so it was a little questionable, like, okay, what's kind of going on here? But so, I, but yeah, to answer your question, I think that's probably what that was meaning because in the movie, you didn't really see, you didn't really understand that until you kind of started putting the pieces together. Mm -hmm. Um, But you could tell that he did have some odd behaviors, posted notes all over his bedroom. At one point he was like in a closet. Yeah. I thought he was having a memory issue because he was putting all those post-it notes around. I personally thought that there, there was some like, I don't want to use the, use a term, but I, I thought he was dealing with some mania or, you know, something like that in depression. So that was what I thought from watching the movie. But again, like I said, they don't say specifically what mm-hmm. what what was going on. Yeah, and just to kind of bring this thing full circle and start to wrap up this episode here, we have to get to the part that they shared memories and there was this one scene where they were at a lake. Stop. And they were swimming and, and just swimming, having Stop. a great time, a fun time. And Violet... Finch went down low, like down deep in the water. And so she kind of panicked and thought that like he drowned or something and wasn't there. And he, she was really mad at him for playing a joke on her. So he was fine playing a joke on her because she had already experienced that kind of loss with their sister. So she like was sudden. mad about that, that sudden loss. Mm-hmm. So instantly the panic, which I can relate to. Now if I get phone calls at odd hours or anything happens, that can just smell like something bad is happening. I go into a panic. So I related with her in that moment. So that was a joke. They played the game Marco Polo. You say Marco, the other person says Polo. So we're going to speed this thing up. Finch kind of had like a little breakdown, a fallout. They kind of had a, like a little argument situation happen. He went missing. She, she told her parents about how he saved her at that moment when she was going to jump, potentially. And so he, she says, well, I, it's my time to go and try to save him. So she goes on his hunt trying to find him, mm-hmm. tracing back all the places, all of these things. She went to all of those bright places. And unfortunately, she ends up back at the lake where they were playing this. He was playing this game with her. She sees his clothes. I believe his car. Yeah, his car was his there. His truck, I mean his van. His clothes. So she's thinking that he's like swimming. She starts screaming. His name, all these things. And she yells out, Marco. I'm starting to like get like sad and there, all and over there again. Was, and there was no polo. <laughs> and so he died. I didn't see that coming. Yeah, that was really. I, I definitely didn't see that coming. I didn't. I thought it was. I thought the movie kind of wanted us to feel like that was going to happen once she gonna. got to the water. Yeah, but yeah, it yeah. Was, but it wasn't. But it did. Mm-hmm. And if you've ever loved anyone and felt really close to someone and had memories and shared things, oh, you're getting emotional and shared things and, and a bond. It really can can trigger you because that's how things happen. Where I can only imagine in that moment she felt like time had ran out. Mm. And, and and it was like you feel so powerless 
And I believe that a lot of us have experienced that. I have. And you just, and you're just literally, she was in the middle of nowhere by herself screaming. And it was just, that was a really, really powerful moment uh, of the movie. And so unfortunately, if you plan to watch it, you'll know the ending. But, but it was, still watch it. But still watch it. It was still a good movie. How many movies do we know the ending of and you still watch still, it? Right. And you might see it differently than we do. You might take something else from it. Again, always a disclaimer, depending on where you are in your grief journey, it absolutely can be triggering because yes. that ending loss was triggering for me. It really made me feel emotional. But this is just another opportunity for us to highlight grief, mm-hmm. talk about grief. And shout out to the to the team, the writers, and everyone that put the film together. I think it was based on a on a novel as well. I've been doing a lot of movies that have been based on books as well. But it was a joy. It was it was a pleasure to watch it, yeah. although it was very sad. I, I like seeing it, and I think young adults definitely need to see it, and and older people because we need to spot these things in our young people and, mm-hmm. and understand that. Because even again, one thing we missed was like Violet's, Violet's parents were also trying to cope and kind of deal with the loss of their one daughter so they had a scare too that kind of brought up their their trauma as far as thinking that something happened to her after something happened to her there's her sister in a car accident so it's a lot in the movie jam-packed with a whole yeah. lot of grief a whole lot of messages and a lot of good things like that good movie we well, can only well done yeah we can only pray that you have taken something from this episode we're going to continue to keep doing these reviews as much as we possibly can definitely subscribe to the channel if you like it leave us some comments whether this is on Apple, Spotify, wherever you're listening, you can leave a comment as well and share the podcast with someone else in your life. We definitely want to do that. So I want to bounce into our inspirational boost as a part of our show where we like to give a quote, something thought provoking, something along those lines each week for our audience. And that is brought to us by our sponsors, Adina J Designs. They make, create, and inspire us, do decorated apparel, custom tumblers. They're doing a lot of phenomenal things. Definitely follow them on both Instagram and Facebook at Adina J Designs, A D E N A J A Y D E S I G N S. And this week, our quote is Instead of worrying about what you can't control, shift your energy to what you can create. I love that. It's kind of also too like broken crayon still color. Mm -hmm. Nice. So you can create something beautiful out of this story, but it's totally up to you. Do you have anything you want to add to it? Yeah, no, I I love that quote. It's my, it was my weekly wellness and um, that's why I wanted to share it with, with your audience. Yeah, I I think it was awesome. So the last thing here we want to get into is our In Loving Memory segment. It's a part of our show that's very important to me to make sure that we humanize our loved ones. And this week, would it be in March the 15th, we are going to say In Loving Memory to my late, phenomenal, amazing, super loving, super grand, superhero, Margaret Reeves. She unfortunately passed away March 15th, 2016. And so this makes five years without her. She's certainly absolutely missed by myself and my entire family. Yes. Grandma, we miss you so much. And I love hope that we're you. making you proud. And, and we love you a lot. So that's our love and memory segment for this week. Guys, it has been another phenomenal episode of the Grief Bully Podcast. Make sure you go and follow our guest co-host, Adina J Designs, on Facebook and Instagram. Check her out over there. She's also got Lash Lush by Adina J. Yep. So if you're in the South Jersey area and you're looking to get eyelash extensions, they are the company for you. You already know where I hang out the most over on Instagram. So follow me there at I underscore AM underscore J Nicole guys. So next time you already know love and light. Peace. Peace.